this is an important session. Uh, I, I would venture to say uh, the most important. And there's a reason for that. Is that when we talk about the mission of the church, or the mission of Christ, uh, in planting and releasing men and women into the nations of the world, that's got to be the primary thing, the message of the New Testament. That's got to be the thing. So I think this is pretty important for us. And I think, as has already been said, the goal of this particular session, in terms of the people that we're talking to, is that we would identify every person in this room, potentially, as a David. There's some marble blobs out there. <laughs> Untapped potential. Things that need to be wrapped out of you. Things that need to come out of you. And um, I love the story of Peter uh, walking on the water. Not so much because we see a man who's stepping out of the boat with great faith, but I love the idea that Jesus believes that Peter can walk on water. <laughs> and, and I have the idea this morning that Jesus is standing in front of us and saying, I believe that we can have another wave of church planting come out of our togetherness, out of the churches represented in this room, and that we can reach and touch not only the cities and the nations and the towns and the villages of this nation and beyond, but we can touch the nations of the world. That surely is the first and foremost goal of local church in the New Testament. So that's why this is important. And I'm really excited to have a bunch of people up here that have all, uh, in, in, in recent times, uh, and recent is relative, but have all planted local churches, have all been on this journey, and I want to get a little bit of that story out of their lives. And so, Jody, we, we met last night, and if you could come, Jody Romero, who's married to Vanessa, they planted a church eight years ago in the suburbs of Los Angeles, and Jody is going to join us on stage. Yeah, yeah, come on, give him a hand. Now, now that's the Marine. Now we've got the super mom. Uh, that's Debbie Sudworth. Uh, now... Her and her husband, Steve, planted a church in downtown Chicago. That is one of my favorite cities in the world. I, I'm a little jealous. Chicago is just amazing. And 14 years ago, they planted a church. They have three kids, and it's a privilege to have her. Come. Come, come, come. Debbie. And then we have the Braveheart couple from Scotland, uh, Rick and Amy. And they planted a church in Aberdeen, Scotland, 15 years ago. It's great to have them on the stage as well. And lastly, we have Tim Peterson. Now, that should say enough. I don't need to add anything about Tim. Tim is, is kind of a, like a comic superhero in his own right. And you've got the tree to contend with, Tim. Sorry. Now, there is, there is a particular goal, and I've, I've shared my, my goal with, with everybody that's up here, and that is to, to make church planting accessible to everyone. When you look at them, you may think, well, you know, we have the, the Marine, the super mom, the brave heart, and, and Tim Peterson. <laughs> you think, oh, that's not accessible to me. I'm not, I'm not anything like them. No, no, you're not. But the call of God to evangelism, to mission, the call to plant, the call to reach into the four corners of the world is to all of us. And, and I want you to see the normality and the life and the struggles and the battles in these next few moments as we share together. So I'm going to ask, uh, maybe we can start with, with uh, Rick and Amy. Just share the story of how you kind of got about planting a church. Okay, so, so it's a bit complicated really because we don't come from South Africa. We don't come from uh, an NCMI partner in church. We uh, helped uh, NCMI partner in church to plant in England. And through that, meeting various people from the apostolic team, we, uh, we caught the bug. Um, let's say we heard the call. But the reality was, we caught the bug. We actually started rubbing shoulders with people, ordinary men and women, who had an extraordinary God, and they demonstrated that truth in helping and, and really nurturing church plants across uh, the UK at that time. And we got caught up in this. And uh, for us... When we went to plant, although we never came from an NCMI background, there was no other option but to do it the New Testament way. And the only way we'd seen that 
was through our friends in NCMI. So, so Amy, how, how come Aberdeen? Well, I have a slightly different slant on it because Aberdeen, we moved originally with, uh, we moved originally with Rick's work to Aberdeen, but we knew God had something for us. When uh, Rick came home one day and he spent a lot of time with God and he said, Amy, I think we're called to plant a church. My amazing submissive heart said, no way. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, I held on to that for 18 months. And uh, anybody knows me and Rick, they know we're quite stubborn. I am doubly stubborn, no. so we have incredible marriage, <laughs> you know. And... Uh, <laughs> And, and I said to Rick, I said, God has to tell me himself that we have to do this work in Aberdeen, otherwise I'm not doing it. And uh, you never say that, okay? Anybody who, you know you're called to something and you just have to be obedient, you, you have to follow that call. And so it was Aberdeen, that's where we were living, and we, we went on a trip to Wales to help with a tent mission. And... Uh, a guy from America was speaking and I was at the back with the children, came forward for prayer and he went for it. And he said, you know what God has called you to, stop doubting, stop being double-minded and do what you have been called to. <laughs> so uh, I call it a spiritual slap around the head. There was snot, there was makeup everywhere. It was beautiful and glamorous, but that's when I knew it had to be Aberdeen. Yeah, wonderful. Now, Debbie... You and Steve leading a church in, in, in this province, in, in the northern part of, uh, of, of this province. How, how did the call of God to go to America, how did that all begin? Uh, well, we weren't leading when we were here. We were on eldership yes. uh, with Alex and Michelle and Lauren. That's right. um, but the call began many years prior to that. I think we also joined uh, Tandaza under the leadership of Terry and Sandy Kruger, not knowing what we were in for. Um, very shortly after that, began to catch the heart of what it means to be uh, a going people. And what turned out to be a couple and two little girls heading for the everyday life of business and um, raising our children became an epic journey of uh, saying yes to God's call. So we, Steve had been traveling to America on business and every time he traveled there, he would weep when he landed. Uh, he then made room uh, on economy class for me <laughs> to travel with him. Uh, he downgraded from business to economy so that I could go with. Thanks, baby. And, uh, you know, I, I had the same experience. We would, we would land on American soil and we would see, sorry, the flag and uh, hear the anthem and our hearts just leapt. Wow. So we knew, we didn't know how, yeah. but we knew. And uh, just, then it was a process of working yeah. it out with our team. Now Jody, you, you're, from, you're from the US. Yeah. Um, how, what, how did you hear the call of God? What, what was the context to go Jeez. to California? It was, a, it was a process of probably prophetic words spoken over years. Uh, a little bit of my testimony last night. At 13, there was a woman who had prophesied over me in the church that I, that I was a part of. So my father was a pastor of this church, and the woman said, hey, you're, you're going to be the pastor of this church one day. So as soon as I could, I enlisted in the Marines, so that didn't happen. <laughs> um, eventually, I came out of the Marines. Uh, Vanessa and I met. We got married, and, and just like anyone who grew up in East L.A., we wanted to get out, so we moved out to Ontario. We bought a home there, and we were based in Kevin and Cindy Booth's church. Oh, yeah. um, we were raised up. One of the first prophetic words spoken to us there was, this is going to be a training ground for you. And so not coming from a prophetic culture, we, we did hold on to that, and it was that. And for the next um, seven, almost eight years, it was training central, LTTs back then, just holding on to what God was saying for us, uh, and then there was a call. Um, my father was, um, his church was diminishing, had offered the church to us, but that fell through twice. Uh, it was a denominational church and just kind of all those weird things that happened. So about the third time around, um, it was just God saying, 
how many times do I have to tell you I am calling you back wow. to East LA? Yeah. So we uh, started a house church in East Los Angeles, and that's kind of the way wow. it started. Yeah. Well, I love that. Now, Tim, yours is the, the youngest church represented. Uh, I don't know whether you're the youngest here. You probably are. Um, and and uh, how, how did your journey begin, planting a local church? Sure. I think it goes way back because in growing up, I was told about Jesus, and then I kind of went off the rails and came back again. And eventually, I think it was after school, I did Alpha. And I thought, like Jody preached when he... He said, your passion should never change. And I thought, if Jesus is real, which I truly believe he is, is there anything I'd rather do in life than tell people about Jesus? Uh, and then I went to Bible college. A lot happened. And 15 years later, uh, I planted a church. So it was quite a journey from when you feel passion and you feel called and you feel like something stirred in your heart to when you get to a place where you actually do it. So it was a long journey, lots of character building, but the passion was always there. So I'm interested for all of you, and this is a question to, to everybody, how did you start? You know, uh, uh, you may have taken over a small group of people, there may have been a couple of people there before you started, or whatever the journey was. How did you begin? Uh, what, how did you kick off? Let, let's, let's make it accessible sure. for everybody. I think one of, one of the best things that, that worked out with us is eventually we first submitted it to the eldership team that we were a part of before we launched. Um, it, 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 it can get hectic, you know, um, with ideas, and you have to hear God, and when you hear God, you got to answer what God says, but we, we started there, um, and, and when we heard God, we were like, if, if no one comes, we're, we're still going to go, but when God's in it, you just begin to, to watch God gravitate people to what you're doing, so we, we started having meetings in our home 40 minutes outside of where we're actually going to plant, um, and cultivating um, the culture that we wanted before we even stepped onto the ground. So you began in the home? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. The, the rest of you, did you also start in homes? Rick? No, we, we, we had this great idea. We, we actually thought we were the big hitters. You know, We'd helped a few people to plant churches, and, and you've probably been there as well, where people have been sent from your church, and we, we thought we knew a thing or two. So we, we hired a hall, a school hall. We made the janitor put out 100 chairs, I leafleted the whole area, which is about 5,000 people within that, that near community. And uh, Amy cooked and, and made sandwiches for 100 plus people. We were really in faith. And, uh, and it was us and our two children at the time. And, um, and rock on 7 o'clock in the evening uh, when we're about to start. And there were two other people. And we were That's looking revival, at, I'm telling you. Yeah, well, but it was. Two other people we knew from another church. <laughs> <laughs> and um, by, by the end of the evening, we had a couple more people as well, also from another church, <laughs> that felt sorry for us. So, so we... <laughs> so we went our, all in. In our arrogance and our, and our thinking we knew a yeah. thing or two, we actually did it very differently. And, and uh, I think uh, if we could do it again, it would be different. <laughs> yeah, if I can say that. In a home? Who else? Yeah, we, uh, we landed in Chicago on a Tuesday and thought, well, we're here to start a church, so let's start on the Sunday. Uh, Steve always says he would do it very differently looking back. Um, it, was, it was a little bit ignorant, but we were full of faith. We knew two people, um, and one of those people offered up their apartment to us. So we started, and we had our two daughters and two others. And two weeks later, the first girl got saved, who was a friend of a friend. And uh, the next week, our first uh, visitor got saved again. A, ge a gentleman got saved. So we just, we just did it. We didn't know any other way. So we thought, okay, well, let's just go for it. Wonderful. Tim? Yeah, we also started in a home. We were about an hour away from where we lived. So we went down, met with some friends, and they were like our people of peace. So we connected with them, started in their home. After about a month, they said, look, you need to find another home. Uh, the lady was having a baby, so we found another home. We were there for about nine months. Uh, then we eventually moved into a school classroom. And we said, when we get to a core group of 30, then we will officially like, launch ourselves as a church. So it probably took about 18 months. Yeah. So you know, people don't see the kind of hard work in the background. They just, oh, like, since it launched, it, it's gone well. Uh, so but we, I, 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 just, yeah, well you've I got to jump in. to interrupt you. 30. <laughs> 30. 
I just say that in our arrogance and our pride and our calling, that after two years we had ten adults. <laughs> huh? It's true. Thirty. Look, we had, if we had to wait for thirty, it would have been a long time. We would have been in. I, I, I noted that you guys embarked on a on a on a million uh, pound building project, and it's it's it with with thirty four people, was it? Yeah, absolutely. So. <laughs> So, it's either stupidity or faith, and I'd like to go for the latter. But we eventually built up to 34 adults, and, um, and we saw a million pound building. In fact, someone had put in a bid for 1.3 million pound, and, uh, and we bid for that, and we got that. And that's another story. So, so this is a question again for all of you. Do you did you feel qualified for this? No. Absolutely not. Tim? N not at all. Like, really, I mean, you feel cold, yeah. but in hindsight, you realize how little you know every day. Uh, so, I, no, I didn't feel... Okay. <laughs> what, what, yeah, what qualified you then? I, I, I'm just about to say, I felt really qualified. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> I, I went to Bible college. I had a master's in philosophy, a master's in, in, in uh, science, I had a, a theology degree, uh, I thought I knew a bit, I'd been in a church that had planted. And then we planted thinking we knew everything, and then once we'd planted we realised we knew nothing. I tell you, we, we knew nothing at all. And, and within a week someone had been murdered, and oh, wow. no one taught us at Bible school how to do a funeral, or... Uh, she... <laughs> I think my biggest worry was running out of preaching material. And so I, I sat down with my, with my uh, former lead elder, and he was like, I think you got about two years in you. Uh, and after that, you're going to have to start, you know, digging your own stuff. And so I think it lasted about a year because we, we were trying to do two services at that time. So, so, so in, in saying, hey, we're, we're, not, we're not qualified, yet we are called, uh, how, did, how did you transition that in your hearts, in your minds, uh, it, in, in, in God qualifying you? I mean, you, you had a sense that God was speaking to you. What did he say to you? Yeah, Debbie, go. Um, I was going to say earlier that we still don't feel qualified. Um, I, I feel like, you know, with the things of God, what he calls us to, our dreams should always terrify us, uh, if they're God dreams. Yeah. I think the transition is bringing it back down to the fact that all he calls us to is to love his people. And that looks different for everybody and in, in every season. But whenever we used to get overwhelmed by what was happening, and even now to this day, we go back to God and his word is always, I called you to love my people. And we're like, okay, we can do that. And that helps the transition from feeling like yeah. you, you can't do it to you can, because we can, we can all love God's people. Yeah. 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 I think for, for us, I've noticed if, you, if you're looking for a, a platform or a pedestal or something, and that's your motivation to plant, I just don't think it goes well. Uh, but I truly believe for, if there's someone listening here that has something stirring on your heart, if you love God's glory more than your own, then God will use you. Um, so I just think we should actually long for God's glory. Uh, and everyone, I think everybody's got something in them. I, I, I truly believe... If I can plant a church, everyone in this room can plant a church. Uh, you just need to love God's glory, and then he will use you. So that David message was just so fitting Absolutely. for anyone that has a heart to plant. So you've all had struggles in this, and that's an assumption. I think it happens to everybody. Uh, how, do you, how have you overcome those in the journey of planting? Uh, the, you know, the head-ons that, that happen quite quickly in the journey, I think, when you feel like, are we doing the right thing? Uh, there's not enough people around. What, what, what's happening? How do you overcome those doubting moments? Well, doubting moments still have those, but I think when we planted, it was almost like an American country song. So we lost our house, we lost our car, <laughs> we lost our dog. Um, and so I, I had I had purposed in my heart that I was gonna I was gonna work for one year, and then after that one year, 
maybe at that time I would I would try to go full time, and uh, I I didn't I didn't follow through with that, and so the Lord uh, got me fired at that job or laid off at that job, and so there's our financial resources. So you, you it just felt like you're losing everything, and then at that point you're holding on to God, just like we should have been from the beginning on, at every level financially. Yeah. Um, through ministry, as a couple, as parents, as, uh, as leaders. And, and, and it's really in that that you find his provision for everything. Yeah. Uh, and as, as you watch that take place, supernatural things just yeah. begin to happen. Money from strange places and, and vehicles and houses and just, this, just the wow. way God works out. But it's really knowing that we're holding on to him for everything. Yeah. Because if we can make this thing happen, then we're, we're going to end up running it into the ground and allowing God to build it yeah. up. So, Yeah. Amy? The difficulties? Yeah. How, how do you handle those when they come along? So for us, you have to be totally reliant on the call of God. You know, God doesn't change his mind on these things. So if you've been called to plant, when the rubber hits the road, you've got to know that you know that you know that God has called you to it. And sometimes they, they were the, that was the only thing that kept us going. But God hasn't changed his mind. God hasn't given us a different plan. So we need to keep doing what we've been called to do and be faithful in that no matter what. And there, were, there was, you know, blood, sweat and tears along the way. But God is still God and God is still yeah. good no matter what was going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, That's right. I believe we, we, we certainly need to be secure in the call. But for me, that apostolic support was massive. Uh, actually, I remember saying to Peter, I apologize. I think I phoned him about six times in one day um, just to get different advice and different things. And I, I just remember keeping certain people close because you, you've got nothing to prove. You don't want to go and prove you can do it. You, you want to go and s succeed. So you might as well pull as many people as you can close to you so that you can lean on them and grow from their wisdom and experience. So I remember calling a lot of people a lot of times, um, but that apostolic partnership is massive. It makes a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever feel like maybe giving up, Debbie? Were there moments like those? Um, if I'm honest, uh, I feel like I have never struggled too much with that, um, but Steve has. There's, there's been moments. <laughs> oh, I'm not throwing him under the come bus. Defend yourself. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I think as, you know, the visionary yeah. um, and being, you know, the man that he is uh, with his own struggles and his own insecurities, um, there's, there's been some pretty hard knocks along the way. But I agree so much with what Amy said. You have to know you called, um, because that is the only thing that gets you through the end of the day. And, uh, you know, she said that God doesn't change his mind. And the beautiful thing about church planting, and I said it earlier, was that the reason we church plant is not because of us. It's because of God's people. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And he journeys with us. And if we allow him, uh, he sees us through everything. And the reason he does that is because he wants us ultimately with the unique gifting that we have to reach the lost. Yeah. And each one of us carries something beautiful that's meant for something else. Yeah. And that something else is his people. Yeah. And so he's not a God of mystery. And when tough times come, he's right there. Yeah. And he sees us through and he reminds us of why we're doing it and who we're doing it for. And if those things are still in place, you can get through it all. Yeah, it's wonderful. Now, I, I want you all to imagine that there are 500 slabs of marble yeah. sitting out in this audience, all with various stages of imperfections, process of God working in their lives. As men and women that have walked this journey for a number of years now, what would your kind of parting shot be uh, and you all got a shot. So uh, if, if you would speak to the David, the potential, uh, what would you say out of the wisdom of your five to 18 years sitting on this stage of church planting? What would you say to the potential church planter in this room? Rick, you can go first. I think go for it. Rick and then Jody. I think it's just to realize that it doesn't matter where you start. It's how you finish. 
And, and that's true with your Christian life. And, and I think for the first couple of years, as you can tell, I was a very arrogant person. Hopefully that doesn't come across too much now, but I was a very arrogant person. And for the first two years of the plant, I know without a shadow of a doubt, not so much for Amy, but for myself, God was shaping me, building me. And I want to tell you that if you even have an ounce of a calling of God to plant, he is interested in you. You are called to the people, but he's interested in you. He's interested in you being shaped, you finishing the race well. And, and I honestly can say that my relationship with God now, having been through the things I've been through, uh, is far, I mean, exponentially more tight with God than it ever could have been if I just sat on the core and sat in the pew and stayed on eldership at the church we were at, which was a great church. But honestly, he's interested in you. And if you have that call on your life, I don't think you can miss it, but please respond to it because it's for you as well. You have been called and chosen and you know it in your heart. Right now, you know it in your heart. Don't keep putting it off. Because one day you'll turn around, you'll be in your 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Not that that's an old age, by the way. Uh, Thank but, you. But you might, yes. <laughs> you, yes. You might, uh, you might regret that you didn't answer the call. And God has something for you to shape you and to shape your nation. It's good. For his glory. Good. I'm going to share um, Deb's sentiment and just this ability to love. Um, I see a lot of, a lot of leaders who are, are passionate about the things that they're passionate about, preaching, worshiping, um, prophesying, all of those kind of things. But all, every one of those giftings has to come out of a place of love. So when you're thinking about church planting, this is, this is one thing that I think needs to be cultivated more in, in churches and training, is do you have the ability to love gather? Like is, are people following you because you have the ability to love them and and lead them towards Jesus if you if you can't gather in that way I mean really good luck church planting if you can't gather that way in a children's ministry setting or in a home group setting or a worship team setting then good luck church planting because people are going to come to a place where they're loved they're going to come to a place where they, where they find family. And I'm not just talking about community. I'm talking about a kingdom family that is headed towards a destination of Jesus. And so I think love gathering is, is one of those things that you, if you want to know if you're going to be a good church planter, just take a look behind you and see how many people are following. Um, because that's going to be a picture of what it's going to feel like when you step out of the boat and say, hey, we are going to do this thing. So. Hebrews 12 verse 2, something I've held on to, is let, let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Uh, because in this call to church plant, you can start focusing on ministries or strategies or, or whatever it may be. But we call to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. So if we just keep our eyes there, we don't belong to ourselves in the first place. We belong to him. So he can use us where he wants us. But my encouragement to you would be keep your eyes fixed on him. So if God says something, be quick to obey. Just do that. If you feel stirred to plant and you, it's your 90th birthday, plant. Just keep your eyes fixed on him and he will use you. The ladies get the last word here, so go for it. Okay. The thing of not leaning on your own understanding, we can so easily disqualify ourselves and talk ourselves out of something. And uh, because we know our failings, we know our failures, we know all the bad things about us. But you know, God is an incredible God and he yeah. believes in us. He believes in each one of you that he has planted that seed to, and that put that calling on your life to go and plant. So don't lean on your own understanding in this, but pray for godly wisdom. You will walk into things where you will have to speak to a, a bereaved mother who's just buried her child, to a marriage that's broken down, to an abusive home, to someone in prison, to so many different things that 15 years ago when we planted, there was no way on earth I felt qualified for. I still don't to some extent, but I pray for God's wisdom 
every time I pick up the phone, every time I go into a meeting, God, I need your wisdom because my understanding, my own ability isn't, isn't where it should be. But in God, I really can do all these things. It's wonderful. Yeah. Um, there's so much I would say, but I think if I had to choose one thing, it would be to invest in your relationship with Jesus always. Uh, I think it's easy to depend on God when things are really hard and it brings you to your knees, but we can sometimes get off of our knees when things are going really well. And uh, having planted and then getting the, the momentum of leading a church, uh, so often you can lose sight of uh, our first love. And so I think my encouragement would be to once you know you called and what everyone else has said, make sure you invest in your first love, in your relationship with your king. You know, we, in, in, in this world that we live in, um, we're encouraged to worship heroes and, and people that are held up on movie screens as being important people. But we have a, we have a partnership together as local churches with apostolic ministry. And I think it's really, really important that we have heroes of the faith that we can emulate, that we can say, actually, I want to do that. Sure. Uh, if, you know, hey, you, you may want to be on an eldership team, you may want to be on a deacon team or something, but I, I, I want you to think of these men and women sitting on this. They don't think of themselves as this, but I want you to think of them as heroes that ought to be emulated, that ought to be said, we want to do that. And I, I, want to, I want you to give them a hand. I want you to stand up. They can stay seated, but I want you to give them a clap. Because they're our heroes. Well done. A, a little more. Come on. Come on. Wow. I would ask you just to give me your attention for another, another 20 odd minutes, 25 minutes, as we close the session out and really trust God that there is a commissioning moment from heaven for all of us. Maybe those of you that have been in local church for a long time, maybe you've led for a long time, the primary role of local church pastors and leaders is not to grow local churches, it's to multiply them. Our job is to multiply seed out of ourselves into the nations of the world, into the neighborhoods, into our cities. And so part of this journey is to, to see this happen again and again and again and again. I think there were moments in our uh, togetherness where we kind of, you know, we began to focus a lot on maybe something a lot closer to home. I think the Holy Spirit is putting his finger on the nations of the world is our inheritance again. And I think he's asking us to widen our vision and release our very best and release our young men and women to the nations of the world for the adventure of their lives. It's time. It's time for us to see another wave of men and women go to the nations of the world. But I want to share something briefly with you as a bit of a setup to possibly calling those that are really sensing something in their hearts uh, for this call. But there's a challenge often with church planting. It is that we're so focused on church often. Church seems to grab our mind a lot. And our meeting culture has often disconnected us from the mission and the evangelistic focus we ought to have in reaching the world. We become so focused on doing, on doing meetings. In fact, even when we say the word church planting, the, the, the problem with church planting is church. Uh, because church captures us, planting kind of disappears into the background, and, and we end up thinking church. In fact, most times when we talk about planting a church, what we end up doing is we end up talking about starting a meeting. In other words, we hire a place, we do a thing, and we gather people, and we try and get people into a meeting, and much of what we have spoken about in local churches as evangelism over the last hundred odd years has been very meeting and church 
focused. I think God wants to invert us. I think he wants to get us thinking beyond the walls of the local church. I think he wants us to think about the mission and the challenge to reach the world and not just to be thinking church and church meetings. Mark 16 verse 15 says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. And whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. What are they to believe in? Of course, it's the gospel they're to believe in. The gospel is front and center to the idea of church planting. And I heard, I heard in their stories, woven into their journey, you can hear the seeds of the gospel woven into the stories of their lives. Church often tends to get in the way of that idea. We become so focused on doing what church does and sucking up the resources of people and everything and deacon teams and eldership teams and everything else we do into the idea that we need to run and do great meetings on a Sunday. Now, I'm not against great meetings on a Sunday. Hey, we need to do that well. We need to celebrate well. But there's an overriding purpose to our celebration is that we would be commissioned, that we would be called by heaven, that we would hear, as these men and women have heard, the call from God to go into the nations of the world and start an adventure of our own with the Holy Spirit. That really is the challenge to all of us. I know I'm going to, probably some of you won't agree with me, but I, I'm of the firm opinion that Paul never really planted any churches in the New Testament. He said, well, hey, Pete, he planted all the churches in the New Testament. Well, I'll I, I, I prove it to you. Acts chapter 17 and verse 1 says this, And Paul and Silas and traveled through the towns of Amphipolis, whatever that is, Apollonia, and came to Thessalonica. Okay, so they arrived in Thessalonica, uh, where there was a Jewish synagogue. And as, Paul was, Paul's, as was Paul's custom, he went to the synagogue service. And for three Sabbaths in a row, he used the scriptures to reason with people. Now, Paul did this again and again. I can carry out multiple scriptures because he, the pattern is exactly the same. Every time he gets into, he goes into the synagogue. And, and you've you got to understand who Paul was. Gamaliel was his Bible teacher. It was like the Einstein of the day. So Paul, if you're in a physics environment, Paul arriving in and he goes to the local university, to the physics class, he would have been like a superstar. Because he had Einstein as his personal mentor. You know, this would have been something. So Paul had like an open door into every synagogue because when he arrived, his reputation would go ahead of him. He would arrive in, the synagogue doors would fly open and Paul could talk. So he goes into the door that he has in every town that he's in. And what does he do? He does exactly what the scripture has encouraged us to do, which is to communicate the gospel. He goes in some places reasoning, it says, around the gospel. In other places, he just preaches the gospel. And immediately it talks about men and women in that place becoming adherents of the faith. They, they receive the gospel. They believe in the gospel. And you think, well, oh, here we go. Now we're cooking. Well, for three weeks, Paul preaches in Thessalonica. And then it says that through various circumstances, he was forced out of the town. And he goes to Berea, and from Berea he goes on to Corinth. And from Corinth, church history tells us that one month later, he writes one Thessalonians back to the Thessalonian church. I have questions. What church? What church? Three weeks preaching in the synagogue? Who's leading? Where are they meeting? Don't you have questions? I have questions. And, and you think, well, this is just a one-off. No, this happens regularly in the scriptures. It seems like there are some places Paul hangs around for a long time, a church is established. But this is the fundamental idea of the New Testament. This is why it needs to be accessible to all of us. That the gospel has inherent power in it. That when it is preached, it transforms human lives. When it is shared, the story about Jesus upon the cross and resurrected Christ, when it is communicated, lives are transformed. Things happen. People believe. And when people believe, the gospel has gathering power. It gathers people to Christ. And when people begin to gather, it seems in the New Testament, churches 
happened? So this is the thing. For all of us in this room, what is our primary responsibility then? Surely, the primary responsibility of every believer is to be a gospel preacher. Surely. In other words, before we talk about planting churches, surely all of us should be on gospel preaching adventures. All over our lives, everywhere your synagogue is, in Paul's context, wherever there is an open door, you ought to walk through that open door, preach the gospel where God has given you a door. Tim speaks about a man of peace, goes into a particular part of town, a space is made available to him, and what does he do? He preaches the gospel. You, you may, didn't hear him. But he preaches the gospel. He communicates the gospel with people and people believe in a church, the formation of a local church begins because the gospel has saving power and gathering power and when people come, they gather. So here in the New Testament is this strange idea that we are to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole of creation and when people believe, when people come, when people are gathered to Christ because the gospel has been preached, local churches happen. I, I, I love what Joseph said earlier. I, I, for one simple reason, it just resonates, I think, with all of us. The idea that God believes in us and that we ought to believe in people. You, you may have things stirring in your heart to do for the king and for the kingdom of God. And you say, well, I'm not sure anybody has ever made space for me. Nobody's ever created a gap for me. I'm here to tell you today, the gospel always creates a gap for you. So, well, I just wish I could, I could be on an adventure. I, I, I just wish, oh, I have news for you. You can. Because the gospel creates space for you. If you take the, the message of Jesus Christ into your mouth and you begin to share it and communicate it, people are gathered to the gospel. They are transformed by the gospel. And in the gathering of people, the potential of something to begin has already begun. Your adventure has started. Now, some of you may not need to lead local churches. Maybe that's just an adventure you need to do in your business, in your work, in your area, in your suburb, in your city, in your town, and gather people into the life of local churches. But as you submit what God is doing with you to the elders and to the leaders of the local church, who knows what could happen? I have been absolutely amazed at who God can use. Ah. I have. When I led a local church I, 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 for, for, for 20 odd years, I, you know, local church, in, in some ways, it limits you a little bit. You, you say, well, no, no, we can't use him. It's a third, third marriage and a thing. And a, I'm just saying, there's some limitations. Now, I'm not putting that on anyone. You know, it, he, his life's a bit too messy. We can't. You know, so you, you begin to say, let's just stick with the, you know, the safe stuff. I'm just saying. So don't get angry with me. But, but letting go of, of leading a, a local church, I suddenly began to realize that for us to reach everybody, God wants to use everybody. That actually, actually, for the world to be reached, he has to use other people other than the men and women in this room. Because if he just uses us, we'll have more people like us. And that leaves a whole bunch of people out who are nothing like us. I've had the privilege of, of doing various experiments around our city. And even at times sitting with a bunch of people looking to start a local church with people who hated church. They just got burnt by church, didn't like church. And gathering them to the gospel and their common denominator was they hated church. I thought, what a, what a fab idea. What a great idea that God would use everybody, that God would use burnt people to reach other burnt people, that when they get healed, they begin to produce healing in other people. 
they, they, Tim said these words sitting on this stage, that if God can use me to plant a local church, he can use everybody. And I'm here to tell you today, I think he can. I think God delights in using everybody. Showing off his glory through people who don't think maybe they can quite fit the bill or quite live up to the billing of what they think it ought to be. Jesus starts out his journey with a couple of boys, probably in their teenage years. Peter, the disciple, was probably the only guy that was maybe 19 or 20. He was the only one that paid temple tax together with Jesus. All the rest were all teenagers. You think to yourself, what a story. That the whole known world is turned upside down by a bunch of teenagers. We, we, we see, you know, in the, we see these old men and I, I don't think that accurately reflects what, what really happened in those days. God delights. I'm involved in projects around our city where God seems to just delight in using unusual people. People that would not normally be used. Quan and I had the privilege of sharing in the U.S., just recently in a, in a particular local church about, about church planting, about starting these missional adventures, not only in local churches, but outside of local churches. And a young girl from North Carolina came up after the meeting and says, you know, I'm going home to look after my special needs sister. And, and I'm thinking there's got to be a lot of parents of special needs children who can't go to local churches. Do you think it's right for me to start something? So, so I said, why not start a gospel preaching adventure? Well, I'm here to tell you today that this young girl, not married, in her 20s, has, has started preaching the gospel. And, and moms and dads and special needs kids and God gave her a building in her city. I would be surprised. Other cities in the U.S. are phoning us saying, can't you start a project in our city? And all she does, she stands up and preaches the gospel. People are getting saved. People are getting baptized. I was just recently back to the U.S. again and she walks up again. She came to one of our gatherings. She walks up again and says, you know, i got this group of people. I, I, I don't really know what it is. Can I call it a church? She says. I said, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to fall foul of the NCMI rules. No, I'm, I'm kidding. You know, I, I, I don't know. I said, but just keep doing what you're doing. Keep preaching the gospel. Keep getting people saved. Keep letting the gospel do its work. We, we need to get back to the idea that the gospel is front and center of everything. And I want to say to you, every person in this room, this is within your ability. It is within your, maybe you're bored. Maybe your life is not really working out the way you wanted it to work out. I've got an adventure for you. These men and women should inspire you to an adventure. It's time for you to begin to preach the gospel. You know, the world wants to sell the idea that we are not good enough. If you have curly hair, you need to straighten it. If you have straight hair, you need to curl it. If you're dark-skinned, you need to be lighter. And if you are light-skinned, you need to be darker. And if you're fat, you need to be thin. And if you're too thin, we need to fix you. <laughs> but the gospel comes with one primary purpose, to qualify you. To qualify you. To say, actually, the king of heaven believes Believes in you. Believes that you can do it. Believes there is a call and a purpose and a plan for every human being. Don't let church get in the way. Robert Logan writes this. He says, the relationship between gospel proclamation and church planting is so intimate, it cannot be divorced without doing violence to the mission of the church. The primary mission of church is to proclaim the gospel and gather believers into local churches where they can be strengthened in their faith and made effective in service. God has placed within all churches the potential to grow and reproduce. In fact, church planting is the most effective means of evangelism and church growth. 
Ed Stetzer says this, in winning new converts to Christ, church plants are light years ahead of the average church because of their focus on reaching the unchurched. It is critical that if we want world evangelism to succeed, we have to be on a church planting mission. We have to be church planting machines. And so often, when we look at these men and women sitting up here, we think to ourselves, well, you know, I don't really fit the bill. You know, I'm not a Marine. I'm not Braveheart. I'm not Supermom. I'm not Tim Peterson. No. You are you. You are you. And God has called you to be on mission for him. Many local churches make the mistake of saying, okay, so we've got to do a church plant. Let's take, you know, 20, 30 people. Let's go and do something. And, and that whole adventure of saying, we're going to go do something in that part of town and we're going to send a bunch of people. I'm happy with anything. You can do anything as long as we're planting churches. But often we wait so long because all the conditions have to be right. All the money has to be in the bank. All the people have to be lined up. You know, the AV has to be perfect. The screens have got to be up. The sound's got to be good. And the worship leader's got to be there. And the, you know, we've got to have a kids ministry person. And, you know, they have it all working. Then we can do a great church plant. I, I want to tell you that these people didn't have any of that. I want to strip it back a little bit and say to you what we need, again, is the gospel to be front and center. The gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel in the mouths of men and women who believe in the truth about Jesus. And we can begin missional adventures all over our spaces. It was written recently, and many church plants think like elephants. Now, elephants have the longest gestation period in nature. Nearly two full years it takes for an elephant to have a baby. This 260-pound baby will feed on his or her mother's milk for at least six months. And this whole cycle won't start again for the mother until her calf is fully weaned. And for the calf, it'll take 15 years before he or she can begin his or her own reproductive cycle. Now, let's take a look at the reproductive life cycle of rabbits. <laughs> the gestation period for a rabbit is usually a month. At birth, a single female rabbit will typically expect not one, but up to 14 babies per litter. Within minutes after giving birth, it's possible for a female rabbit to be impregnated again. That means a female rabbit can potentially have one litter per month. And as early as six months into their life, rabbits will begin reproducing. What a difference. If a rabbit has an average of three female babies per litter per month, then at the end of year one, there will be 37 female rabbits including the mother. If all 37 reproduce at the same rate, then at the end of year two, there will be a total of 1,369 female rabbits, including the original 37. At the end of year three, it jumps to 50,653. And so on. And while the rabbit has had 50,653 babies, the elephant still only has one. There's a problem in the church. We think like elephants. We need to think like rabbits. We, we need rabbit thinking in both ways of that term. Rabbit thinking. Let's think about multiplying, releasing, believing in people. Say, so oh, whoa, whoa, do you think I can do it? Oh, I think you can do it. So, well, isn't that risky? I, I'd, I'd rather believe than find ourselves creating barriers of hurdles and things we want people to jump all the time, putting up things for people that they cannot actually step into the call and purpose of God. Let's rather make a few mistakes. We may make mistakes, but let's rather believe. Rather than being slow on the move, let's speed this up. Let's trust God for a new wave of church planting. So, this is the charge. If you're sitting in this room and you're saying, I am, I am primed 
for an adventure. I don't know. I just feel like I've stalled. I don't, you know, I've, I've heard the call of God so many times. I've just, I've just always, there's always been stuff and things and my life is, I feel like I've stalled. I, I need an adventure. Oh man, you're in the right meeting. Because, because we're going we're gonna to do the rabbit thing. We are. We, we, imagine, imagine, imagine if 300 churches were planted out of KZ and Equip. Imagine. Imagine if that doubled next year. Imagine the impact upon the world. Imagine the impact upon our province. Imagine the impact upon this nation. Men and women preaching the gospel everywhere, gathering 20, 30, 100, 300, 1,000. It doesn't matter what the number is. It matters that we're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what matters. So, some of you have a profound call. You have this, oh, I'm going to plant a church. I, I, I want you to. Not just... Not just the board. You have, you, you've got a profound sense. God has called me. Uh, 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 Today is a commissioning day for you. But for those that are sitting in this room and say, oh man, I've heard God speak to me so many times over my life. It's, it's time for me to do something. I can't sit on this any longer. Maybe you're preaching the gospel in your context, in your neighborhood, in your suburb. Maybe God is calling you to another nation. It does not matter this afternoon. What matters is that we're obedient to him. That we begin. That we start the adventure. So many people have dreams, but they never start the adventure. So today, we're going to get a kickstart from heaven. We're going to begin the adventure. And multiple adventures, missional adventures, journey with men and women in this room, are going to start as a result of this moment today. That's my belief and prayer. So, if you're up for it, I want you to stand up on your feet and I want you to kind of, I don't know, it depends how many there are. I mean, I, we can fill the space. But, but I, I want you to say, I'm up for the adventure. It's time for me to do something. Stand up. If that's you, come. Come, 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 come. Flood up to the front. Flood up to the front. We've got to act. I'm up for the adventure. Church planters, come on. To the four corners of the world, God is sending us, releasing us, calling us. Come, press forward. Press forward. I'm thinking rabbits here. I'm not thinking elephants. Stuff stirring in you. You know, some of you are sitting here and you, you're kind of on the other side of 60. And you're thinking, okay, so, so this is not for me. You're wrong. The gospel needs to be in our mouths. And it's time for you to stand up and preach again, sir. Ma'am, it's time for you to stand up and preach again. God's calling you. He's calling you to minister. He's calling you to lead. He's calling you to step out in faith. And if you think, oh, no, I'm not qualified for that. Or you're just the person that God wants to qualify. So come. Come. If that's you, other side of 60, you think it's passed you by? This hasn't passed you by. This hasn't passed you by. Amen. Come. There's still people coming. We'll let them come. So we're nearly done. I want, I want everybody in this room to stand up on your feet and stretch out your hands. Stretch them out. There are two reasons why I want you to stand. Because half of you should have been up here. So you may as well stand. But I want you to stretch out your hands to these people. And as you bless them, as you release them, as you empower them, the life and the Spirit of God. Something's going to happen today. It's like a switch is going to get thrown on the inside of you. The adventure begins again. Some of you have done this. The adventure begins again. Starting again. God's saying, come on. I have more for you. 
I have more. I'm calling you. So Father, right now, we stretch out our hands to these couples. In the name of Jesus, we have heard the call of Matthew chapter 18 that says, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. And Mark that says that we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel. So I pray for every person standing here that this will be a significant moment in the life of our province that there will be out of this group of people multiple, not one, not two, not three, multiple seeds sown into the ground of our region, our nation, our nations, and the nations of the world. Seed sown in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for your grace upon these men and women. Thank you, Father, right now, spiritually, you throw the switch on the inside of their lives. Right now, right now, say, I believe in you. I believe. I believe you can walk on the water. I believe. I'm calling you, my son, my daughter. I'm calling you to walk with me. I'm calling you out to the water with me. Now, will you obey? Will you come with me for the adventure of your life? It starts now. It doesn't begin one day when you arrive in a new place or in another town or in another place. It begins now. Now the gospel preaching adventure begins. Now, today, God throws the switch in your life. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We receive right now. I pray for every person standing out in the audience now. You're actually calling us all to this journey. Not only to be supportive, but to be on gospel preaching adventures together. Stir our hearts. Call us into this journey, I pray. All of us, in Jesus' name. We receive this call now. We receive our commissioning from heaven now, in Jesus' name. And we make it ours. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for calling us. I just felt that there might be people here who've said, I've tried it before. I've failed before. I've I've messed up before and I feel just as Peter was calling and even those people God is calling he says my hand just as he did with Jonah he gave Jonah the same commission I feel if that's who you might be there today and you might be saying oh I I don't know I've I've made such a blue of it I feel like God is saying but I'm calling my, my voice is calling you the same way as I've always called you and I've still got a plan for you respond to that call don't look at what you did yesterday. It's always into the future. He always gives us a future and a hope. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Um, I had a picture of God giving out blueprints, plans to people over the, these few days. Um, everyone was completely unique and different, but God was handing people blueprints yeah. with their thank names you. on. It, not just for churches, but for businesses of how they could impact um, their sphere of influence for the kingdom. Yeah. A new wave. A new wave, Jesus. A new wave. During the team gathering in the morning, I received this word for, for this entire room, that the wells that would be filled at this time would quench the thirst of the nations. Yes, Lord. And so if I can ask you just even to do a prophetic act, just, just hold your palms to the Lord and just, just ask him even now, Lord, fill my cup. Fill my cup. Lord, fill my cup. Fill my cup. Fill my cup, Lord. We're asking you, God, to fill these wells, not only in, in these church planters, these faith-filled people who have come forward, but even those who are standing, yes, Lord. maybe shaking in their shoes. Maybe we're feeling anxious, God. Lord, fill our cup. We desire to quench the thirst of the nations. We are trusting you for this next season, God. We are trusting for a new wave, God. (laughs) Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We receive those words, Jesus. Let us be men and women that quench the thirst of the nations. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.